Hello, guys and gals, and welcome back to another episode of Creepy Pastas. Yes, Creepy Pastas, the non-gaming ones. This one is pretty lengthy, if you can tell by the time code below. I mean, holy crap, it's one of the longest episodes we've done. It's called 1999, and it's one of the greatest Creepy Pastas ever. Trust me, you'll really enjoy this one. Because of its length, we're just going to dive right in. That being said, sit back, relax, and enjoy 1999. The year is 1999. That sentence brings me back to my senior kindergarten class when I was five years old, where we used to read out the date on the blackboard every single day. The year 1999 exists as a stain in my mind, however, as a memory that will not go away no matter how I try to forget it. 1999 marked the year I lost my first tooth, my first time on a plane, and unfortunately the early loss of my childhood innocence. That one memory that refuses to be wiped, it all started with that new, oral television. At the time, Pokemon was the latest fat to hit the school. Pokemon cards, games, stickers, and the most popular, the TV show. So of course, every time I came home from school, I would stay glued to the TV until Pokemon came on at 5. The only problem was that my dad watched the news at 5.30, and Pokemon episodes were back to back, which meant I had to miss an episode every day. Something I whined on and on about. My dad got tired of hearing me complain every day. That must be why he went and bought another television. My dad put the television he bought in my room. Unfortunately, it was just an old, small boob tube with rabbit ears even. It also had only 20 channels available, not including the channel Pokemon was on. I recall I didn't care though. I was just thrilled I had my own TV in my room. And after surfing through the channels, I came to the conclusion that only Channel 2, TVO Kids, was worth watching. So I watched that for a while. It wasn't for another few months until I discovered Channel 21. One day in April, I was flipping through the channels trying to see if Pokemon was on. I pressed Channel 21 into the remote, hoping that there were more channels. And to my delight, there were. My dad was surprised too, but he, you know, he let me watch it because it seemed to have kids' programs on. The channel was called Calden Local 21. And later I found out it was indeed broadcasted from the town of Caledon, Ontario, a town very close to my city. The shows I saw in Caledon Local 21 looked poorly made, and I never understood what was going on in them half the time. However, though, as I grew up, every time I thought of that channel, I realized more and more how messed up the shows were, and I had to ask myself, what the fuck was I watching? The following is a list of shows and episodes I remember seeing on Khaled and Local 21. How I remember such a detail even disturbs me, but I guess things like this stand out in your mind for a while. April 1999. Mr. Bear's Cellar, Episode 12. A very sketchy name if you were to look at it nowadays. The show featured a guy wearing a bear mascot costume, who would get a new visitor into his or her cellar every day. It was always a kid. The show was filmed with a camcorder, not a very good one either. The police asked me a lot of questions about the show. The episode started with Mr. Bear sitting at a table. He just sat there playing for a bit until there was a knock on the door. The camera was then looking up at the stairs of the door where there was another knock. Mr. Bear climbed the stairs and opened the door to reveal two young children. One was a boy about my age and the other was a girl who looked about eight. Mr. Bear danced in delight and then started to talk to the uh, kids. I couldn't hear any of them that well I remember. Mr. Bear then led the kids into the cellar, which was quite dark, only lit by a small oil lamp on the table. I can't really remember that much more, except him singing a song which I couldn't hear too well either, probably because of that large bear mask. The episode ended with them playing hide-and-seek, with the kids hiding in a closet and Mr. Bear counting. May 1999, Soup and Spoon. I don't even think this was a show, it might have been just a special movie thing. All I know is I stopped watching Khaled and Local 21 for a while because I thought this show was too stupid. Especially since Pokemon now came out at 4.30 and 5. I don't remember much of this, but it showed a can of soup and a spoon both attached to strings, swinging back and forth as if someone was holding them and dangling them in front of the camera. Interestingly enough, the show was shot in a basement, which looked just like the one used in Mr. Bear's cellar. Like I said, I can't remember much. The only thing I can remember clearly was the end. The entire thing was only half an hour, and just included stuff I found stupid, such as a spoon chasing the soup around trying to eat him, and about seven kids sitting around it, each with a bowl of soup in front of them. They were sitting and looking at the camera with confused, almost frightened faces. The cameraman then held a can of soup in front of the kids and said, Spoons ready? And then it just stopped. July 1999. 
It was summer and I hadn't watched Channel 21 for a while, until one day when I slept over at my friend's house I decided to check it out again. My friend had gotten a TV in his room for his sixth birthday, so he stayed up very late, for us 9.30 was very late, and watched television. That's when I remember Channel 21 and brought it up to my friend. We decided to see if it was on and to our surprise it was. They must have changed the broadcast in time. Mr. Bear's Cellar, episode 23. You know, this episode was entertaining for my friend and I mainly because it actually had swearing. However, now when I think of the episode, I realize something was definitely wrong when it was filmed. The episode started with the camera on its side, while it was facing Mr. Bear, who was walking upstairs to the cellar door. The camera then blacked out for a second before fading in, back upright and facing Mr. Bear. There was another kid talking to him, but this kid looked about 11 or 12. He was talking to Mr. Bear for a while, but I couldn't hear well, again with a crappy camcorder, until the kid started raising his voice. The kid was saying how it was late and his sister had to go home. You could also hear more voices in the background. I remember Mr. Bear clearly saying, get the fuck out, you're not invited, with a deep voice muffled by the bear mask. I remember my friend and I looking at each other and laughing at a mention of the forbidden F word, but the episode got weirder. The kid began climbing the stairs before turning around and saying how he was going to call the police. Mr. Bear began breaking into a run towards the kid, who started screaming and running as well. The camera then cut out, and that was the end of the episode. The channel then turned to static shortly after. August 1999 In August, I grew more curious to see Mr. Bear cellar for some reason, though the last episode I saw was weird and at swearing, which also made me think the show was meant for teenagers. Nonetheless, I flipped on a channel 21 when my dad was busy. Mr. Bear Cellar, Episode 28 Apparently this episode had been playing the entire month of August. It was studied by, you know, the police a lot. The entire episode was just Mr. Bear sitting in a chair talking to the audience. Hello kids, do you want to visit my cellar? If you do, please write me a letter at this address. The screen then switched to a white screen with multicolored letters reading the address. And what was, uh, remained for the rest of the episode. And guess what I actually did? I sent Mr. Bear that sick bastard who portrayed him a letter. I did it out of curiosity mostly. My dad was okay with it because he thought it was a legit kid show. But then again, he never saw any of what was on channel 21. So my dad sent the letter to the address Mr. Bear said on the show. It stayed on all day anyway for some reason. It took about a week to get a response, which I was surprised I did. I still have the letter I received August 15, 1999, and it reads, Dear Elliot, thank you ever so much for your letter. I would love to have you in my cellar. We play games, watch movies, and go fire camping in the middle of the woods. Come to my house at, the police cut out his address, Caledon, Ontario, Canada. I look very forward to having fun with you. Love, Mr. Bear. I cannot believe my dad never found the sketchy because he actually took me to the house. And then that's when the police became involved. Those endless questions, those pictures of terrified kids, the woods. This brings me to why I'm writing this blog. That psycho and his friends did some fucked up shit back then. And now it seems like he's trying to get into contact with me again. The entire police thing is coming back. It's brought back 1999 to me. Over a decade later and it's happening again. People have been emailing me exactly what was happening in 1999 and I'll get to that. Those weird TV shows I was watching apparently were meant to attract kids to Mr. Bear's house. What Mr. Bear did shocked the entire town. My dad actually drove me to Caledon along with the address Mr. Bear left on the letter. The house was actually in the outskirts of the town, in the open farmland. I still remember that house. It looked like an older farmhouse that looked like to, you know, had been built in the early 1900s. The windows were all boarded up and the house looked like it was in a state of disrepair. And as we walked up to the house, I remember my dad checking the address over and over again and looking at the house in disbelief. Then the door opened. I expected Mr. Bear to be at the door, but I was surprised to see a police officer emerge from that creaking doorway. The officer began talking to my dad, while I quickly asked if that was Mr. Bear's house. The officer's face cringed slightly and muttered, Oh God, or something like that. He started talking quietly to my dad, so I couldn't hear, although my dad told me to go to the car anyways, and then we just went home. My dad was quiet the whole way, and I felt something strange had happened. My dad never told me what happened for a while. I forgot about it anyways, too. Channel 21 no longer came on. And when I asked about it, my dad would not acknowledge its existence. I think it was when I was 13 when I learned the truth. I remember Channel 21 one day and asked my dad about it. I guess he finally decided I should hear the truth. Caledon Local 21 was a local TV channel that ran from October 1997 to 1999 in the Peel region of Ontario. 
The entire channel was made from a house in Caledon, the one I visited, and run by a man who was not really known by anyone in the town. The channel was only available to older TVs because the signal was the only one that was picked up by rabbit ears or weaker frequencies. The man created all the shows on the channel, all of which were kids shows. He was Mr. Bear, and he was a mysterious cameraman. The real reason he created the channel was more disturbing than what was originally thought. As you might have already guessed, he kidnapped kids and held them in a cellar. But while most people thought he was a serial child molester, he really wanted to use the kids for another purpose, and the day I arrived, the man had fled his house the night before. The day before the police went in for their investigation, it wasn't... I wasn't the only one who was watching. Sorry for not answering any questions for so long. I haven't accessed my email account for some time. Anyways, let me finally set things straight about what I know. Back in October, I visited the house previously owned by the man who ran Caledon Local 21. Two women lived there, operating a daycare business. How ironic. Now to answer the questions, you guys emailed to me. Question number one. Who else watched Caledon Local 21? I know other people watched it for sure, including those kids who wound up at Mr. Bear's house, and after some Google searches, I found a few people in the Neo Seeker forums who were discussing shows from Caledon Local 21. They talked about the kids' shows I watched, but also two other shows I'd never seen before. A user named I Am Real Life seemed to know all the shows that were broadcasted on Channel 21, and here are the two I've never heard of. The Fallen Angel in Life, described as a fairly boring show with a guy rambling on and on in front of the camera, about how we must please Satan and appease him before it is too late. And then Paint with the Soul, described as Blair Witch-like, consisted of a cameraman wandering around a forest at night doing nothing particularly interesting. I'll always go looking for the uh, conversation and see if I can, you know, get that link. But moving on to the next question, where is Mr. Bear or the guy who wore the costume? If I did know, I would have said earlier, but I have no idea where the guy is, if he's dead or alive, hopefully dead. When I see my dad's friend next time, I'll ask him about this. Maybe I can get a more definite answer. The final question is, what did Mr. Bear do to the children? This is by far the most common question I've been asked. I found this out in October as well via my dad's friend who is a retired Caledon regional officer. Apparently the man playing Mr. Bear took the kids out of the house and into the forest nearby. What he did there, police are not exactly sure how it happened, but 16 charred bodies of children between the ages of 4 to 13 were found by a in a 15 by 15 foot ditch deep within the forest. My dad's friend did not want to go into exact details, but I'm seeing him next Thursday anyways, so maybe I can extort more information from him then. That's all I have for now. Thanks for keeping an interest in my blog. I'll try to gather as much information as I can for my next post. I've actually been getting pretty interested in this myself. It should be my right to know what the hell happened. I'm sorry I haven't posted anything for a while. I kind of lost interest in the blog since I hit a standstill while looking for more information about the identity of the owner of Caledon Local 21. However, a few weeks ago I struck gold. I found some answers, surprisingly, from the father of a kid I used to babysit. He lives just across my street, and I used to look after his kids when they were younger. He currently doesn't have a job either. He used to live near the woods outside of Caledon and witness the owner's activity in the mountains. His name is Anthony Polo. When he lived in the small bungalow outside the woods, he would often venture into a in, in to smoke a joint of marijuana or two before returning to his work as a wood craftsman. Polo described that sometimes he would hear voices of children coming from deeper within the woods, as well as a glowing light off in the distance. Polo told me these events started in late 1997. This is around the time Calvin Local 21 began airing. He apparently became annoyed by this happening every once in a while and actually went to investigate. Polo then described what the whole scene looked like when he got there. There were a group of kids, he said about 13 to 17, aged 5 to 12, gathered around a large fire pit with a burning fire. With them was a single adult. Polo talked to the man, noticing his unusual, unkempt appearance of a crack addict, as well as his constant twitching, and asked what he was doing out in the forest with children. The man said they were on a camping trip, something they did frequently. Polo, not suspecting anything, because Caledon is one of the lowest crime rates in Canada. Simply left it at that, and told them to be quieter. Polo then paused for a while before telling me that they never became quieter. In fact, sometimes he heard loud changing from the children in an unknown language. He didn't bother beating the man again as he was moving anyways. I told Polo that the man was probably the owner of Caledon Local 21, but he doubted it, as he heard that the man was moving to Pickering by several of the residents near the area. Here's what I know now. The man would take kids into the woods regularly for camping. 
The fire pit Pola described may be the hole the bodies of the children were found in. The children Pola saw are probably the ones found dead. The man moved to a city called Pickering, the smaller city east of Toronto. I'll discuss this with my dad's friend, the ex-cop, and see if this matches anything the police knew about the man. I also want to see if he has any other knowledge of what was aired on Caledon Local 21. Good news, guys. I talked to my dad's friend and he disclosed a lot of information to me. First, I asked if the police had any information on the man who ran Caledon Local 21, and he replied that they have only had the same leads for years and never found a suspect. However, the Peel Regional Police do have some of the tapes found in the house Caledon Local 21 was broadcasted from. He took me over so I could watch a few. I guess I haven't said much to, about him yet. My dad's friend's name is Mitchell Wilson, a pretty nice guy. He seems to understand my thirst for knowledge on what happened during the late 90s in that house. He feels it was wrong that my dad went so long without telling me much. He took me to the Davis Road Police Station, if you don't know it's the largest station in Caledon, and one of the largest within the Peel region itself. Each of the main stations around Peel have some of the tapes. Unfortunately, I wasn't allowed to take any home for obvious reasons. Paint with the Soul, Episode 10, Garbage Thrown Away Paint with the Soul is one of the shows that I Am Real Life and Ziggy92 discussed on Neo Seeker. I told the police about this and they informed me that 12 episodes of the show were made and broadcasted between December 5th, 1997 and January 8th, 1998. Exactly as they described it, the episode opened with a cameraman wandering around in a forest. It appeared to be during the evening as it seemed the sun was setting. The cameraman walked along a path until he got to an area where there was a lot of garbage laying in the leaves. The camera looked around at the various wrappers, bottles, bags, and boxes, making sure each item got a few seconds of screen time. The camera then focused into a large area before the man spoke. I recall he spoke in a very timid, quiet voice. And I swear I've heard it somewhere else before, like on another Caledon Local 21 show. I could barely hear what he was saying, but he mainly talked about how humans are garbage or something that had to do with saving ourselves by cleaning up the garbage, which would be us. It actually sounded really stupid, but still, a feeling of dread came over me, and I mean the forest was possibly where the bodies were found, right? Mr. Bear Cellar, Episode 25. When the police administrator brought this tape in, I actually said, Oh shit, and chuckled a bit out loud. Of course, I got stares from the staff, but Wilson explained to them about my little experience with Mr. Bear, and I still kept the letter he sent me. Like the previous episodes, this one included a guy wearing a bear mascot costume. Following him were 16 children. Some looked as young as four, others looked like they were practically teenagers. And as the children entered, the administrator commented that this is the only episode that showed all 16 victims. The kids all looked rather content, except for this one who had visible bruises on his face. And unlike the other kids, he had a more fearful expression. He also looked about 11 to 12, which caused me to recognize him. It was the kid that asked about his sister, and subsequently met an unknown fate at the episode of at the end of episode 23, the one episode I watched during July 1999. When I told the administrator this, he confirmed it was the same kid. He was also featured in episode 24, an episode that only aired once at uh, 3 o'clock in July 1999. The police still have not found the tape. Mr. Bear then broke into song, singing about circus fruits and how good vitamin C was for you. I could barely hear the lyrics as they were muffled by the bear mask. The kids all drink their juice, one from episode 23, and the episode ends. And after viewing the tapes in possession of the Davis Road Police Station, I'm satisfied. But only temporary. I still want to know the full story. The police just keep giving me the same crap about the creator of Cal and 21 being a fetishist pedophile, as well as an apparent cultist. I'll sign off for now. Get into university first, get information later. Hopefully I'll get back to this blog as soon as possible. April 17th, I finally got my G2 license in Ontario, Canada. This allows you to drive a car by yourself, as well as with some passengers after six months. I, of course, took advantage of this and drove into Caledon for a little Sunday drive. Since I haven't updated this blog in a while, I figure I might as well visit the house where the infamous channel of my childhood was located. The house looked different than when I saw it last October. The place is no longer used as a daycare and just sat there abandoned. However, it did have a for sale sign showing that someone that still owned it wanted to get rid of it, though. The abandoned house drew fuzzy memories from my mind, mainly the day my dad took me to visit Mr. Bear. A feeling of dread came upon me. What happened to the children while they were living in the house? I walked up to the steps in the front door and peered through the window. 
Inside, I could see a near empty hallway with a few boxes at the end, and in the end of the hallway to the right was an open doorway, presumably leading the, to the kitchen. To the left were two doors, but apparently leading to the rooms visible through the windows outside. I wondered where the cellar entrance was located and whether it had been sealed up. I walked around to the back of the house and found my answer. Two wooden doors lying at an almost flat angle were padlocked shut. This had to lead to the cellar. Not wanting to hang around, you could imagine what was going through my mind at the time. I departed. Beyond the house, the empty field continued on until I reached a dense forest that lined the horizon. I wondered if that was a forest where the bodies of the children were found. I thought to myself, fuck it, and proceeded to walk across the field behind the house into the forest. The forest was oddly quiet, save for a few periodic sounds of a woodpecker drilling into a distant tree. I cautiously made my way deeper into the forest, not really caring about the fact that I had no idea where I was going. I don't know how to explain it, but it felt like there was something I had to find. I came to a thinner part of the woods and a few small houses in the distance. Paulo's house crossed my mind, and I wondered if one of these homes had belonged to him. I neared a small clearing in which I could see three adequately sized logs gathered around a black charred area, showing a small fire had been lit there recently. Hey, get the fuck out of our fort! Those words nearly gave me a heart attack. I turned to my left and saw two dark clothed people running towards me. My, my initial thought was to run. However, as they came closer, they were really just kids in their early teens, possibly 13 or 14 maybe 12, and as they approached me they realized my size as well. I'm 6'1", while well, they could have been no bigger than 5'8", one might be 5'7", we said, get the fuck out, the larger one, you know, who was wearing a slipknot shirt and had said half-heartedly. I stood my ground and shrugged. The shorter one who was wearing a Metallica shirt swung out with a butterfly knife and held it in my direction. No, you wouldn't want to, in a seat, and I said in a deep, serious tone, trying to sound as badass as possible. I pulled out my cell phone. The two kids withdrew, the one in the Metallica shirt pulling, putting away the knife. Look dude, we don't like people in our fort, so can you just go? The one in the Slipknot shirt said, obviously intimidated. I had no business in the forest anyways, so I uttered out a simple, fine, and turned out, you know, before I realized I had a great opportunity. Did either of you hear of a guy who murdered a bunch of kids in these woods about 13 years ago? I asked the kids. The two looked at each other in confusion before the one wearing the Metallica shirt answered, Yeah, everyone knows about that guy. He said to me as if I were stupid. The kid in the Slipknot shirt continued, He still lives around here in the storm drain. My big brother's friend says he uh, saw him in a bear costume once wandering around the forest at night. My instincts told me this was probably a lie, as the owner of Caledon Local 21 is probably long gone, only existing as folklore in the smaller isolated community. However, as a human, the thought of a mysterious unknown sparks interest within. And where is the storm drain, I asked, just out of curiosity. I shouldn't believe the kid's story. The kid in the Metallica shirt stared at me for a few moments, his eyes seemingly full of annoyance yet curiosity for me. You're not from around here, are you? Why'd you even come here? Now, I do admit I was slightly startled by the nature of the question. However, I figured I might as well explain why I was there, just in case people mistook my intentions. I told the two kids about my experience with the man in Caledon Local 21, and that I had to come to maybe seek out some sort of closure, although though even I wasn't exactly sure. The kids seemed familiar with the channel as they smiled and looked at each other when I mentioned it. They also became more understanding and gave me a detailed description on how to get to the storm drain. Shortly after, I decided to just turn around the way I came and back to the house, leaving the kids at their fort. But now you're probably wondering how I left just a detail out about what the kids told me just now. Is it because I'm choosing to conclude what I've gathered now? Here's what the kids told me in detail. The storm drain lies ahead of the kids fort, the same direction I was heading. The drain ends at a small river, where access water is drained out. Near here is a small playground. The kids told me people rarely use it. The man supposedly lives in a large pipe that rain water drains out of. People have seen him, although always either wearing a bear mask or the mask with the full body bear costume. I do not believe this is true, and in fact simply a myth made by the residents of Caledon. The story does not seem plausible in any way. Why did no one call the police? Didn't this guy look suspicious? And other questions like these leave the story invalid. I may visit the storm drain, not because I believe the story, but because I want an excuse to visit Caledon again, so this block doesn't die. With no more tapes to watch, I don't know what to talk about anymore. Thanks for continuing to support me in my blog. 
I know many are looking forward to more information about what happened in Gallatin during the year 1999, so I will do my best to continue my research into the topic. Elliot out. Wow, nearly five months since I last updated. I'm guessing everyone pretty much thinks I was dead, right? Thankfully I'm not, but in all seriousness, I really have been busy these past few months, and a blog about something that could have killed me as a kid is a little low on my current priorities list. As of now, I'm living in Waterloo, Ontario, attending the University of Waterloo for computer engineering. Yeah, I'm a keener. As you can imagine, engineering is no walk in the park, so obviously I nearly forgot about this blog, but as you can see now, I'm back. I remember to visit the storm drain the kids from the Caledon Forest told me about. It was out in a clearing be between the wooded areas, nearby a marsh. Unfortunately, I found absolutely nothing save for a turtle that retreated into its built-in home when it saw me. I snapped some pics of the pipe, which I posted as well. Also, let me tell you, it's not a storm drain, like they said it was. It was a simple pipe, possibly channeled the nearest access water from the marsh. When I returned from Calvin, however, I simply kept putting off uploading everything until I forgot about my blog. I just didn't, it just didn't seem important anymore. Please forgive me. It wasn't until only recently that I'm now interested in my case again, and on September 10th, I received an email from this email address. Return the B at hotmail.com. Funny, am I right? Well, it gets better. I'm going to copy and paste the exact email this guy sent me. Dear Elliot, my dear, dear boy, I've missed you so ever much. Oh, how you've grown. Your twinkling eyes have stayed the same, however, those eyes looking for adventure. Oh, how imagining them brings warmth to my old bare heart. The day you came to visit me, I felt so happy. I wanted to go out and pick strawberries. You told me you would come looking. Oh, yes. He told me you would come looking. Now it'll be soon. You won't be so lonely soon. I'm ever so sorry. I couldn't say hello when you came to visit. Not once, two times. Do not threat, however. You will soon finally get to play with the other children. I will try making my cellar even more cozier than before. A hundred fuzzy hugs, Mr. Bear. Now obviously this letter is fake, but still I'd like to thank whoever sent it. Just, le just reading it creeped me out, but because of it, I'm now full of this new interest to continue my blog. I guess it's just trying to pursue the mysteries I've always questioned. Now my roommate knows about all this, he thought the letter was real. He actually seemed more scared than I was for a second, but then I shrugged it off and so did he. I mean, what are the chances of it being real? How would Mr. Bear know when I went to Caledon on those occasions, more or less, know my email or me still be interested in his cellar? <laughs> I'm going to send a reply to return the beat. Wow, just looking at the email address, you can tell someone wanted to freak me out. I didn't really, it didn't really work though. Although, to whoever you are, thank you for sparking my interest back into the full matter. Maybe I can find out more about what happened to Mr. Bear. Hopefully because although I didn't buy that email, part of me still feels anxious. Thank you for all those who are still following me and have become avid fans. You are also why I'm choosing to continue this. Thanks, guys. Wow, I can't believe this blog hasn't been deleted yet. I haven't posted anything for so long. I have my reasons and I'd rather not discuss them yet. It's been rather... traumatic for me. Some of you were right. I shouldn't have gone back trying to relive the mysteries of my childhood, but I couldn't resist. It's been over a year since my last post and a lot had happened. Let's recap where I am right now with regards to the whole Mr. Bear incident. Return the beat at hotmail.com is no longer in use. I tried replying to the email, but I got no reply. I tried again back in March, still no response. I've actually moved up to Ottawa, capital of Canada for those who didn't know, for university, so I haven't been back to Caledon for home and, or in the Peel region for a while. I had my reasons for leaving as you could guess why. I've had to make a new email account because people keep prank mailing me pretending to be Mr. Bear. Thanks a lot, guys. Why have I ventured back to this blog? Mitchell Wilson, remember my dad's ex cop friend, gave me a phone call on the 23rd of October about a tape that was found in a branch of the Brampton Public Library. Brampton is my hometown, in case you haven't picked up on that. He claims he isn't allowed to either, you know, just discuss the content of the tapes with me because it's still evidence, but he asked me to come check it out when I return home. The tape got the gears grinding again because we all know what was the last tapes I saw. I can only imagine what can be on it. I'm guessing it must have to do something with Caledon Local 21. I guess I just wanted to say I'm continuing this blog and thank you for anyone following it. I don't know when my next entry will be, but when I see the tape, I'll write what I find. I don't know what to expect, but the idea of seeing another tape has gotten me interested in the whole mystery all over again. Elliot It's been a long year for me. 
The university has been giving me the usual sleepless nights, especially since I transferred to Ottawa, which is the place to party. Sarcasm. But now I'm back home, with my dad in Brampton, the town I grew up in. I got home on the 18th of December, and I've been visiting with friends and family. Or at least, that's what I would rather have done. Now that's festive holiday cheer that I usually have at this time of the month is absent. To, un to answer the hundreds of emails and comments I got, yes, I did see the tapes that my dad's friend promised to show me. The tapes, however, act as a curse. I want to know more, yet I want to know everything. I couldn't help it. I needed to see those tapes. Not for myself, but for all of you guys who are just as intrigued as I am by the ominous man in a bear suit from my past. However, after viewing those tapes, I feel the pit of dread deep inside me once again. The feeling where I know that all those kids in the videos are dead. That I could have been one of those kids, and that humanity is a dark, dark place. If you haven't skipped the paragraph for the juicier details below, thank you for listening to my rambling. On Friday and Wednesday, January 1st, I called Mitchell Wilson and asked if there was a time where I could come by and view the tapes. Things were pretty slow at the station because of a snowstorm. So they said I could come down any time that day. The tapes were located at a branch not too far from me. So I braved the slushy roads and terrible Brampton drivers and made my way to the Peel Regional Police Station, located at the Bramalea City Center. I met Wilson at the front desk, where he then led me up to the second floor, and onto a small office. He instructed me to have a seat and wait while he went out and got the tapes. Before leaving the office, he returned to me and said, I know you're curious, but you sure you want to do this? Of course I did, or at least thought so. Besides, Wilson's friend had pulled a lot of strings to get me in there, and I didn't want to waste the opportunity. 30. Mr. Bear Seller. Never ceasing to disturb me, especially after what happened when I was younger. The episode took place outside in a forest at dark, making it slightly hard to see, especially considering the quality of the film, a trademark of anything from Caledon Local 21. The episode started with the camera being held in the paws of Mr. Bear, aiming it at himself. The bear mask, it looked more sinister in the shadows of the trees. The unmistakable muffled voice spoke up. Hello children, today I'll be doing a wonderful thing for my friends. I'll be delivering them to a faraway land where they will surely be happy. Mr. Bear turned the camera around to show an ATV with an attached trailer. But what stood out the most was that the trailer contained seven motionless children lying side by side. Though this here is the first load, but soon there will be more on the way. Mr. Bear turned around and pointed the camera at the large burlap tarp spread on the ground. He picked the tarp up, revealing a large hole that must have been at least 12 feet deep and maybe about 15 feet wide. The rest of the episode consisted of Mr. Bear taking each kid and dropping them into a hole. I asked Wilson if they were dead, to which he shook his head and replied, not yet. Soon, all the kids were in the pit. Some were in awkward positions due to being tossed in, but they remained unconscious. The vitamin C will surely help these children on the great journey that awaits them. Mr. Bear mentioned as he panned the camera towards multiple bottles of gasoline beside a bush. The camera zoomed into the bottles as Mr. Bear hummed before the episode ended. Wilson revealed to me that there were seven of the eight sixteen victims found burnt to a crisp. That gasoline is what the man playing Mr. Bear used to light them on fire. A pit full of burning children. Who the fuck would do that? The feeling of dread found me once again when I realized I could have been one of those kids. Wilson then explained to me that he'd previously lied. However, he felt that I wouldn't be able to handle the disturbing or graphic nature of the episode. And you know what? Maybe I can't. I don't even want to see it. I'm satisfied. But I just need some time to get myself together. The thing is, the man who ran Cal's in Local 21 is still out there. More to come soon. Once upon a time, there lived a boy named Elliot. Elliot was a clever boy who loved playing with his friend. One day, he watched a lovely television show about a bear and his children friends. The children loved helping each other, as good children should, but they also loved the bear. The bear loved the children since the children were so good at helping him and the fallen angel. The children and the bear wanted to play forever, but the fallen angel needed even more help, so the children had to give the ultimate sacrifice. Because that's what friends do, Elliot. They help each other. Help us, Elliot. Burn with us, Elliot. I want you, Elliot. He wants you, Elliot. Come back to my cellar, pretty please with sugar and icing on top. Mr. B. Well, this is probably one of the longest creepypastas we've done, and you know what? 
This is fucking amazing. Because I won't lie, I haven't had that itch for a while when I read these. You know, that search for the truth, that curiosity here was captured very beautifully. Now, this does hit close to home. Hell, I live in Brampton and I work in Toronto and Caledon is like an hour away from me. And I've been there for work at times too. It's crazy and, you know, just location-wise, it all fits perfectly. Now, the TV channel, if I know anything about analog television broadcasting, it is possible over the air. You need some specialized equipment to do it. Not really specialized, it's really cheap to even get. So obviously, you could transfer the proper bandwidth over the airwaves and go to the rabbit ears, as they so eloquently put it. And trust me, it's easy to set an analog channel. Hell, if you want a video, I can do a step-by-step -step guide on how to create your own television channel. Hell, we could be on TV, but, you know, that's a whole different story. That's entirely possible, and from a realistic standpoint, for a guy like me who works in television and film, I know it's entirely possible at that end. Now, the Satanism and the use of children was, you know, done so beautifully when you saw how it melded so wonderfully at the end with that poem and everything. And the whole experience is just a scary thought. Maybe this community in Caledon does hide this bear, and, you know, this is a dark secret, but that's, again, pretty far-fetched because the people living there are super nice from my personal experience. But the bear, on the other hand, is a fucking super creepy mess. I mean, when you think about it, it's not like it's trying to be creepy like, you know, somebody in a mask or some bullshit like that, but it's picturing just a man walking around in a fucking bear costume or, like, a bear mask. It's just super weird, and it's surreal when you think about it, just living in a pipe when you picture that. Now, the lack of info also, you know, makes sense. Unlike the States, uh, Canada's a little behind in the TV sector. Now, today we've all caught up, but this is, again, back in the day, and even... Then, the desire for sensationalism in Canadian media is not so high as it is, you know, in other parts of the world. So, it does make sense why it's not really there. Now, emails are sent later, and people are met who've, you know, seen Mr. Bear. So, what doesn't make sense is that there's no desire to track the emails if you're really all interested in it. Or really a rush to further pursue the, you know, alleged people who've seen the fucking bastard. And even after all this, if this were to exist, there should be some articles on it with legitimacy, which I don't see. But, this is a creepypasta. So... Thank the Lord, this never actually occurred. Maybe it did, I don't know, hopefully not. But that being said, I won't take up too much of your time, and I'll ask, like I've always asked, is what would you rate this and what would you change to make it better? This has been another episode of Creepy Pastas, and if you like what you saw, then like, comment, and subscribe. This is me, Mood Heart. I am out.